Okay, welcome everybody. Deception Stoppers here with Moses greetings, greetings. and Mark. How you doing? All right. Um, it's been a while. It's been quite some time. I know you guys have been waiting for an update, but there has been many things going on. Uh, we have been quite busy. As you know, we are moving to this lawsuit and uh, it's moving now. With that being said, today, I want to realign the, our focus on something. And uh, specifically, I want to talk more about uh, what I've learned about certain specific laws. And those laws uh, are going to be uh, the RICO law of the uh, 18 U.S.C. 1961 through 1968. Okay, and we're going to go over a little bit of, you know, what that consists of and what that means and, you know, those different provisions under that code. Also, what I'm also going to talk about is the 14th Amendment and what actually the 14th Amendment is, what it means, what it does, what it does and why it was established after the 11th Amendment. All right, the uh, the 14th Amendment was established after the 11th Amendment uh, because the 14th Amendment needed to make sure there was due process, even though the states have uh, immunity, even though you know the states have immunity, have sovereign immunity under the 11th Amendment. Okay, so we're going to get up into that uh, in a bit. So I'm just going to uh, get into it. Well, matter of fact, let's start there. Okay, so first we're going to start. We're going to talk about this uh, the, this uh, immunity, okay, and, and how it correlates with um, how it correlates with the 11th Amendment and how uh, certain different provisions is written into the law in Congress passed to uh, strip the states and some, and some of the state entities of their uh, 11th Amendment sovereign immunity, okay? Now, one of those instances where a state can be stripped of their, um, of their 11th Amendment immunity is if they are receiving any kind of federal grants, so if they are receiving any kind of federal grants, any kind of federal money from the federal government, and they are accused of any type of discrimination, then they don't have any immunity under the 11th Amendment for that. They don't have any uh, immunity under the 11th Amendment because there's something called the spending clause. There's something called the spending clause which says if you are accepting federal funds, if you're getting federal grants uh, from the federal government, then you have to allow some of your sovereignty to be given up, and especially in the context of uh, civil rights being violated, especially uh, as it relates to any type of discrimination. Okay, so uh, we understand that and we we understand how how that clearly works. We did a lot of research and we looked at a lot of uh, different uh, provisions that actually strips the states of their immunity. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and go into the 14th Amendment. And the 14th Amendment is very important. It's one of the most important amendments of all of them. Because, see, what the 14th Amendment says is, okay, with respect to all the other amendments and respect to the Constitution, there has to be some type of due process because if there is not due process, then those other amendments really can't be upheld. How can you up, uh, uphold those if you don't have due, if you're not afforded uh, uh, due process? You know what I'm saying? And, and equal protection under the law. Equal protection of law, equal protection under the law is, is it means this. This is exactly what it means. If I go down to the uh, police station and I file and I say, oh, my God, uh, somebody came to my door. A lady named Lucy came to my door and she had a gun and she pointed at me and they say, OK, whatever, blah, 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 blah. 
and then nothing happens to her. They don't do any investigation. They don't do anything. Nothing happens. But then if I go and I go do the same thing to Lucy, and, and but then they come and they take me to jail, that's not the equal protection of the law. You have to treat both of the parties as the same. You have to give them the same uh, deference. You have to give the equal. And see, um, when you are a plaintiff, the plaintiff is actually given more in the light most favorable to the plaintiff, okay? So, from a plaintiff standpoint, it's, it, it it should be simple. Now, the uh, due process is very important. The 14th Amendment is very important because it can take away that 11th Amendment immunity. So all this 11th Am Amendment immunity that they like to throw around in these paperwork, oh, we get, we, we get this immunity. No, no, because when you dig deep and you go deeper down the rabbit hole, you can see that there's actual provisions that they're held to, but they don't expect people to know that. So if you getting grants, you getting federal grants, there's you you agree to some type of provision to give up some of your 11th, 11th Amendment <coughs> immunity. <coughs> you definitely did. So whether it whether you are court, whether you are whatever you are, I don't care. And they putting in the paper, oh, we're a court, we're not sui jurors. Okay, okay, but the way that the law is written, the way that the federal law is written, the federal law offers a remedy and the Constitution offers the remedy for redress. Now, you don't get to write a law that is primary over an amendment. When an amendment, when a when an amendment is invoked, that's it and that's all. That's the first, that's the ceiling. That's the threshold. That's the ceiling. Okay? You know how in, in, in economics you have a price ceiling and price floor? Well, that's the ceiling. All right? When you reference those, any of the, when you invoke those rights, you don't get to turn around and they don't get to turn around and say, well, this law says this. That law is an inferior law. So a lot of these people don't have the proper understanding. They don't understand this constitution. It's it's a it's a it's a self-governing system. And the people who put it together, they were so smart. Because when you understand it, you understand that it's a it's a it's like a it's a scale, it's a self-balancing system. You basically have to follow one part in the it's just all a system. It's, it, it was beautifully put together. It was genius. And so now we have people who want to drag away the interpretations and drag it this way and drag it that way. And it's just, it's, it's messy. But getting back to the focus of this video is my primary reason of making this video is I want to shed light to you don't, when you violate the 14th Amendment, you don't get to go back to the 11th Amendment. When there is an allegation of a violation of the 14th Amendment, and you can go back and say, well, okay, John Doe says his 14th Amendment, uh, his 14th Amendment, his constitutional 14th Amendment right was violated. Okay, do we have any evidence that his rights were invoked at the time that he claimed that his right was violated? What, where, where, where was his rights invoked? Was his rights invoked? Can he prove that his rights was invoked? Yes, he can. Okay, check one. Step number two. If he can, if he can prove that his rights was invoked, now we have to see was whatever what was going on, was it consistent with the parameters written in the 14th Amendment or was it not? And if it was not, then you have a violation of the 14th Amendment and you have an enforcement clause up under the 14th Amendment, which allows a person to take action. You don't get to go back to the 11th Amendment and say, well, we get immunity because you're basically saying that the First Amendment of redress to the United States Constitution is moot.
You don't get to do that when it's invoked. The only time that you get to do that is when those rights was not invoked, when there can be no proof that that right was invoked because the implied waiver would have kicked in and eliminated that right. But you don't get to just go and do what you want to do when those rights was invoked. You don't get to just ignore that. You don't get to do that. That's not how it works. And you don't get to go back to the 11th Amendment. That's why the 14th Amendment was put in place. It was put in place after the 11th Amendment to ensure that people have an adequate way that they can go back and they can get redressed and that they can be guaranteed due process. If you're going to cite, if you're going to cite, if you're going to go back and cite 11th Amendment immunity, when you know that there was violations and when you know that there was clearly invoked rights is on his face, then, then that, that is also committing acts against the Constitution. You can't do that because now you're gaming the system. You don't get to go, and when someone asserts and proves that the 14th Amendment, any part of the provisions of the 14th Amendment was violated, you don't go back to the 11th Amendment and then say do they get they get uh, immunity under 11th Amendment. You have to refer to the enforcement clause up under the 14th Amendment. And that gives the, uh, the authority, the Congress, the authority to allow the person to have the redress for the violation for that specific amendment, for that 14th Amendment. And that holds all the other stuff in place. Because if, let's say I have a freedom of speech issue, that's the First Amendment. And somebody say, well, I want to I wanna sue him because he, he defamed me. Now, when you go back to the record, what, did he invoke it? Was, his, was those constitutional rights invoked? Uh, yes, they was. Then there is no death. There is no defamation. <laughs> Defamation can't exist in an environment of invoked First Amendment rights. Now, if those rights, if those, if, if there could be no proof that those rights was invoked, then implied waivers will eat through that right. And now you about to have a defamation suit on your hands. You see what I mean? You about to have a defamation problem. And that's how it goes. But these people want to confuse everything. Maybe I should come out with a book and just put it in plain English on how this stuff is done because yeah, the same thing. <clears throat> I mean, the way it's looking like to me, they intentionally miseducate people and uh, they put people in a position to where it's like, okay, well, you it's your fault, you didn't know, but okay, well, yeah, because they didn't know, man, but you y'all. The way y'all writing stuff and putting things, y'all making it difficult for people. So, yeah, somebody need to make it more clear for people. Yeah, and the way that you make it clear is you understand if there's any rights that's invoked, then you have to look at that, that naked right. You don't get to go back and say, well, this law says this. No, no. The only way you could go back and say, well, this law says this, if that constitutional right was not invoked, then you can go to those inferior laws. You cannot just go to those laws when the right was invoked. You have to look at that right on its face and you have to look at the situation to determine if that law, if that right was threatened when it was invoked. You don't get to just say, uh, because then if you do that, now you operating under a custom. You see what I mean? It doesn't have to be an official policy all the time for it to be a manel. It can be a custom. That's why that language is in there. Yeah, whoever wrote that stuff, they... Yeah. Some aliens did. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, it's hard to believe, man, after, after going through all this stuff, it seems with these people, it's hard to believe that a human being, that humans did, we did that. Right, because I sat down, when I sat down and I broke that, when I sat down and I broke that apart and I had it all picked apart and, and, and looked at it, it made my heart beat so fast because I was like, oh, this is, this is cool. This is real, this is a system. This is, this, this, and I understood it how, how I understood how it worked and I was excited about it. So when I got more into it, I was like, wait, wait, wait a minute. And then when you, uh, yeah.
it was but you know it's a gift and a curse but yeah the 14th amendment is powerful you don't get to go back to 11th amendment immunity and then let's also talk about this ex parte versus young Okay. Let's pause on the ex parte versus young. Let's take a side step. There was a case called Monroe versus Pat. Okay. Monroe versus Pat. That case was overturned by the United States Supreme Court. That case was overturned by the United States Supreme Court because these people, um, they wanted to, uh, Basically, Monroe versus Pap made it to where you couldn't, you couldn't sue. Now, Monroe versus Pap was overturned, and the Monel versus the Department of New York Services, the, the Social Services Department of New York, was the uh, replacement precedent for the Monroe versus Pap. Okay, so. Um, Anytime that there is a custom that is done, then you have a Monel claim. Okay, clear, clear and simple. You do not get to assert no immunity against a Monel claim. And Monel claim does not have immunity against it because Monroe versus Pap was overturned. Okay, all right. Now let's t talk about this ex parte versus young. Ex parte versus young is an injunction situation. All right. Ex parte versus young is an injunction situation. So that means that when you take an action under under the uh, doctrine of uh, ex parte versus young, that means that you are asking for an injunction. Okay. Now, there's many different kinds of injunctions that you can get. You got injunctions that you can get. Let's say, for instance, we want to hold a rally. And we feel like maybe the this, this state is going to give us a problem with our rally that we want to hold. So what we would do is we would go to the district court before the rally and get an injunction and say that we want an injunction before the actual rally so that way that there is no violation of our rights because we assume that there will be a violation of our rights. Okay? Now that's an injunction that's an injunction that you can get. That's an that's an, that's a that's a type of injunction that you could get but under ex parte versus young that's an injunction situation and when you have constitutional rights that have been invoked and none have been waived that means that there is no implied waivers that person is under the full authority of all their rights so whatever right that they're trying to stand on need to be primary in that situation you don't get to go back to you don't get to go back to a, a inferior law So uh, that's pretty much how that, that goes. Now, another thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about these, uh, about this RICO, this uh, 18 USC 1961 through 1968. I want to talk about that. RICO is a, uh, RICO, RICO is a special type of, uh, special type of law, okay? And basically it was uh, initially, uh, constructed to target racketeering and organized crime. Now, over the years, you know, uh, humans become creative and, you know, they learn how to navigate through certain things. And so with understanding that, the racketeering law has become a uh, colossal uh, piece of... Uh, uh, legislation that has assisted many different victims of creative ruses and crimes against them. All right. 
Now, I want to talk about something that the a lot of the attorneys were speaking about in our case. Uh, there was motions coming in and in their motions, in their judgments on the pleadings and different things, they talk about, uh, they were talking about, oh, uh, they're citing federal laws that don't provide a private right of action and Oh, oh my God, if they didn't do a state didn't cite a predicate act, oh, well, they only cited one predicate act. I mean, these people were all over the place. And it's like, you know, it's really probably not even their fault because they're caught up in culture, you know? So um, I'm able to look at the law for how it's written and how, it, how it's set out to be. Now, uh, they think that we don't have the ability to bring the uh, the uh, lawsuit because they're saying that we're trying to enforce criminal statutes. And they're saying the U.S. attorney is the only person who can enforce those criminal statutes. OK, they are they are emphatically wrong. And I'm going to explain to you why. And I'm going to explain the distinction between. The different situations so that way we're clear and that way the rest of them are clear um under rico you have something called enumerated offenses okay enumerated offenses now these enumerated offenses consist of many different federal statutes okay many different federal criminal statutes all right now these different federal criminal statutes They are originally only able to be prosecuted by a U.S. attorney, okay? All right. So that's only when RICO is not involved, all right? Because a person, a civilian, cannot bring a criminal action against another civil I mean, against another citizen in federal court. It, it, it can't happen. It, that's, that, it doesn't work. The only person who can do that is a U.S. attorney, a federal prosecutor. All right? We understand that. Clear, clear. Everything clear. Simple like a baby, right? Simple like a baby bottle. Okay. One, two, three. Easy as one, two, three, ABC. Now, now that we understand that, we understand that private citizens cannot file criminal federal criminal complaints okay we get that however when someone commits a federal criminal crime against you if it violates the RICO law alright if it meets the elements of the RICO under 18 U.S.C. 1964, you have the ability to be able to take the action against them. If they violated any of those federal statutes, it does not matter what... So getting back to the uh, RICO subject of the uh, enumerated predicate acts, the uh, enumerated offenses under racketeering activity is the predicate acts for RICO. It's a lot of them. It's a lot of them in there. So, uh, and they've added new ones. They've added uh, new ones. And I think, uh, I believe it's, was it 18 U.S.C. 2 or something? I think it's 18 U.S.C. 2. I think that's uh, aiding and abetting. Uh, that that uh, has been put on there as a predicate act. That has been added. Uh, under the enumerated offenses there is always enumerated offenses being added so uh, that's what that is so the distinction between the uh, criminal provisions and a civil suit is the uh, a, a civilian can definitely bring a civil suit against a person for violating one of those criminal statutes under uh, racketeering activity also referred to as enumerated uh, predicate acts so uh, that's
that's to clear up that confusion because I guess there was a little bit of confusion as to uh, what uh, statutes provide a private right of action to uh, prosecute. So the, it's the RICO law that provides the private right of action for violating its enumerated offenses. Under its enumerated offenses is many of those federal statutes. That's how it works, okay? So if you are trying to prosecute under the federal statute by itself without RICO, that can only be done by a U.S. attorney, okay? So that's the difference. And other than that, I mean, I really don't have anything else to uh, speak about, but it, it just really infuriates me on how the 14th Amendment is not being treated as it was great, as it was uh, carved out to be. There, there, you don't get to go back to the 11th Amendment when you violate that 14th Amendment. You don't get to do that because there's an enforcement provision in there called the enforcement clause of that amendment that allows that uh that strips the the state sovereign uh 11th amendment immunity sovereign immunity away yeah i think if another thing is i think if uh more citizens not uh, of course not attorneys if they're working with them but regular citizens like us if we got more people doing this type of stuff then they'll be following it more but they just they're just they're doing that because they know people aren't effective enough in, in really understanding like how you how you understand it let they know people not really putting all their heart into it and not really going through that stuff thoroughly so they they you know they sit back they like okay okay you put that on okay, you didn't do this okay we just gonna do that and they doing what they want to do and i i know i mentioned this earlier but i want to make it clear and make a clear <coughs> distinction and make it like 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 baby food for everybody when you have a constitutional right that has been invoked, that's it and that's all. It stops there. You cannot go back and you cannot say, well, this or that. No, you, you can't do that. All right? <laughs> you, 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 can't, you can't do that. When those rights are invoked, they, they are primary over everything else. And that's why Article 6, Clause 2 exists, because it's telling all of the judges, the state judges, it's telling those state judges, it's telling, it's saying, look, I understand you got rules, and I understand that you got certain laws, all right? But this law says that if there's any, uh, if there's any constitutional rights invoked, those are primary. I let it. I, I start it again. Just kind of wrap up what you were saying. Like, yeah. So, so basically, uh, about the inferior. About the yeah. Article six, clause two makes the state laws inferior. So you don't get to say, well, this, this, this. No, the invoked rights is primary. Based. So all constitutional rights invoked. Now, wait. We wrapping this video up. Just want to put a little gems out there. You have anything you want to say? No, sir. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you have any questions, enter them in the comment section. And we'll be delighted to answer those questions. In the meantime, in between time, au revoir. See ya. Peace out. Peace.